Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to conclude our conversation with Vicki Speak. This time we're going to talk about how James Strang affected her testimony, not in a good way. We'll also talk about James Strang's death and the succession crisis that uh, followed, or maybe not so much of a crisis, but uh, it was interesting how things worked out in the uh, Strangite church. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Now, go, when we went back to when we were in the beginning, we talked about the plates of Bori that were buried in the ground, and I said that was a faith problem with me. Okay. Well, when I initially started the Strang story, one of my intents was, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I thought as an active LDS woman that I would get all the names of the people that followed Dream Strang and have the <coughs> have the youth in the stake do baptisms for the dead. What a wonderful plan. You know, they wanted to be belong to the right, the correct church, which was obviously the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Lower not the, that's right, with hyphen little D. So we'll just have a big mess baptisms of the dead for all these people that went up to Beaver Island and Debori and all the people that followed Strang. And then I realized that the people that followed Strang didn't want to belong to the Utah church because they didn't belong and that they didn't believe in polygamy and they didn't belong believe in uh, Brigham Young. So that's why they went with Strang. And so the more I learned about the church, the Strangites, the more I learned the differences between the people that went west and the people that went to Bori, to Wisconsin. And I went to see uh, Bill Shepard. I went into their church, and then as you go into the church, right in front of you is a picture of Joseph Smith, and off to the side of him is a picture of James Strang. And I thought, Holy cow, this is real. These people really belong, they really believe in James Strang. And up until that point, it had just basically been names and a story to me. And all of a sudden, it became real. And I saw the Hill of Promise. I saw the houses. I saw the cemeteries. Those people really existed. And they went through terrible trials of their faith and of their lives. They were kicked off of Beaver Island and sent out, scattered across, across the Midwest. But yet there's still, a re, there's still people that remain devoted to James Strang. And we went to the Hill of Promise and I saw the tree, or the area anyway, that's supposed to be where the plates were dug up under that tree. And I could not, for the life of me, figure out how Strang had, could have possibly put those plates in the ground. And I thought, well, if James, if uh, Joseph Smith had buried, uh, had found buried plates, and he translated them, and I believe in that, then why don't I believe in James Strang and the records that he translated? If I believe in Joseph Smith, then I have to believe in James Strang. And then I found out that James Strang had taken an auger and drilled into the side of the hill, into all that clay, took him like three or four weeks before that they were found or anything. He drilled into the side of the hill, he took the clay box and he inserted it underneath the tree because it was on a hillside. And all of a sudden, my faith in Jesus, in uh, Joseph Smith was gone. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Because I had decided that they were the same. I had to believe in one because I believed in the other. And all of a sudden, it just kind of, all that doubt was there all of a sudden. Hmm. So I still have a lot of respect for the 
LDS Church. They're my people and my cultural. I'm a cultural Mormon, although I've had my name removed from the records because of the uh, November 15th, 25th, or the 2015th declaration that was made about the children of uh, gay parents not being able to be baptized. So that was kind of the straw that yeah, broke the camel's it was, back. Uh, but I, it's not, it's been a very personal, a very hard journey for me. And I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. If you're happy where you are, stay where you are. If it works for you, great. And I'm really happy for anybody that can keep that faith. So, but it all comes back to those records underneath that tree. Isn't that funny? So how did you find out about this auger? I haven't heard about that before. I came across a document. I came across a document. There were two things. It said, Uncle Ben used to have an old brass kettle. And they cut up Uncle Ben's old kettle to make those little plates. And they used an auger to put it in the hill. Oh, so that it would look like it had been there the whole time. Hmm? And it's, it was just a document I, mean, sure I just stumbled I, across. Because I've dealt with Strangites before, and they're like, well, that's just anti-Mormon lies. I mean, is that the re reaction you would get to something mm -hmm. like that? Exactly. Is this, like an an, this is an anti-Mormon or an anti-Strangite mm -hmm. propaganda that somebody talked about this auger? Right. Um, but it's a document that I found. Was it, was it from a Strangite or from someone else? It was else? from somebody back in the 18... 50s that said that they had investigated and they found it in his house. They found the auger. They found the auger in his house. Oh, really? Mm hmm. Why not get rid of the auger? Well, he got a dig fence pulse. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got to put the fence in somehow. You got to have the auger. Huh. I mean, because that's one of the. Um testimonies, one of the differences between Joseph Smith and James Strang was Strang had non-Mormons dig this up, right? And so he, therefore he had non-Mormon witnesses. Well, they weren't Mormon at the time, but they did but they join him. They became Strangites oh, they because did. of the experience. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So he was the Mark Hoffman of his day. Mm -hmm. oh, and then wow. as far as the, the Book of the Law, Somebody else found brass remnants, brass scraps, in the attic of Strang's home on Beaver Island. And that person was one of his apostles. And uh, that day, he took his family and left Beaver Island. When they found the remnants? Mm -hmm. When he found the remnants of the brass in the attic of Strang's house, he thought that that's what the, the, books of the, the book of the law was made from. And he left. Because was that a different material than the Vori plates? No, they're both brass. Oh. Could they have been the Vori plates, do you think? Well, the ones that, it could have been the Vori plates, but they found that at a, diff at a different place. They said uh, that, that they had found the remains of Uncle Ben's old kettle. Hmm. And if I had remembered, I should have found those documents to, to <laughs> That's okay. read them to you. That's okay. Wow, that's very interesting. I love these things because I'm always learning stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and there were some people who claimed to have helped him uh, do the, the books of the law. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. uh, no witnesses for the auger, the drill, nothing? Do you think he could have done that by himself? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So just use something that you would dig for fence posts, dig it horizontally. Dig it on the side of a hill. You don't dig it down, you do it sideways. Slip it in. And that way, the dirt's not disturbed, the tree roots aren't disturbed, and the ground underneath isn't disturbed. And who's going to check on the side? Did they have to cut down the tree in order to get the plates, yes. basically? Yes. Oh, okay. They had to cut down the tree. Oh, okay. That makes sense. They had to cut down the tree, they had to cut the roots out, and they had to go through rock and hard-packed ground in order to get down to that little thing. Huh. We, we were talking about how he was a senator in the Michigan legislature. Were mm -hmm. there any important bills that he did? He was, uh, he was a representative okay. instead of a, in the House of Representative. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Anything of distinguishing thing as far as his career as a congressman? He did, uh, I believe he was in charge of the separation of some of the counties, the creation of counties in northern Michigan. But he was uh, very well respected. And uh, he was a great uh, debater, a great orator, and very progressive. And they really liked him in the House of Representatives. Well, his death is a really interesting story as well. He, of course, he was martyred in a similar fashion to Joseph Smith. Um, can, you, can you talk about the events with, surrounding that? One of the things that the Strangites were noted for was they kept the word of wisdom very strongly, much more, much better than the people in Nauvoo did. You hear about the people traveling out west that had their tea and, and so forth, but they were very strict with the Strangites, where they did not have coffee or tea or alcohol. As a matter of fact, James Strang was uh, a member of the Temperance Society, trying to get rid of spirited, spirited liquor, spirits and liquors. Uh, and one of the things that the state of Michigan did was they passed a law that anybody who was trading on the lakes of Lake Michigan had to have a bond if they were going to uh, trade. And uh, so that meant that they had to put money out in order to sell their liquor or they had to uh, do you know, any of their products. They had to make sure that they were licensed and bonded. And they were not to sell alcohol to the Indians. And it was against the law to sell alcohol to the Indians. And it happened that Emmett County, where the, the Strangites were, was the only county in all of Michigan that enforced that law. Oh, really? Which made the people around them very, very angry because a lot of them were traders and fishermen who were profiting off of the Indians. They would... Did it make the Indians angry that they couldn't get their liquor? Mm-hmm. Okay. Made the Indi Indians angry. They would go to, with their skins or their, their whatever they were trading for, and the traders would make them wait to get paid for it. And in the, during the time that the Indians were waiting, then they would get drunk. And then they would end up owing. They would drink more and more and more until they had already drunk up the profits of whatever it was they were selling. So then they were more in debt to the trader than ever before. So that's something that Strang was absolutely against. No selling alcohol to the Indians. And that's what made everybody so mad in the area, especially. That meant the end of their businesses. There were a lot of boats that would come into the harbor on Beaver Island, and they would start selling alcohol to people from Beaver Island that got a little tired of James Strang. Those people would go out onto the boats and drink alcohol, and when Strang found out about it, then he says, well, you guys are going to stop it, or those boats are not going to come in the harbor. I don't care how much profit we get off of them. Those people got very angry and decided to do away with James Strang. It was his own followers. Hmm. They plotted his assassination. And one day, the, the warship, the United States warship, Michigan, came into the harbor. Uh, they asked James Strang to come on board. And two of his followers came from behind and shot Strang in the head and in the back. Uh, he lived for another couple of weeks. He was taken back to Vori and where he died. And the, the mob of people that hated the Mormons, the Strangite Mormons, descended on Beaver Island and exiled all the people. And that was the end of the Strangites on Beaver Island. They, they were scattered all over the Great Lakes. Yeah, I heard that the USS Michigan just 
stopped every once in a while and dropped them off, and they had no luggage or anything, and were just really dusty. They, the mob forced them on the boats with nothing. Uh, but it wasn't everybody that went off without nothing, because some of them were able to get off the island with their stuff. But it was the ones that were later on. They, they had no leader, and the mob came with guns and said, get your stuff down to the port by tomorrow, or we're going to burn your house down, and we're going to kill your family. And once they got their stuff down to the port, they expected it to be loaded on those ships, and the Gentile vigilantes kept it and sent the Strangites off on boats, penniless, with nothing. Yeah, I, I remember John Hamer talking about that one time, and he's like, there hasn't been a more persecuted people than those people. Absolutely not. Um, you know, in the LDS Church, we talk about the Martin and Willie Hancock companies. Mm -hmm. um, and it was terrible because it was in the cold winter, but this was probably, would you say it was just as bad or worse? Or? This was very bad I mean, because I guess the weather they didn't was even know where they were going. Right. They were loaded on these ships. They, were, they didn't know where the ship was going, whether it was going to Detroit or Chicago, or Cleveland, Milwaukee, Green Bay, they and their families might be on another ship. So they didn't know where they were going, and they were landed uh, onto the piers. Sometimes uh, they weren't allowed to be landed on the piers. They, so the ships would drop them off in little communities, little clumps along the shore, and they would walk to the nearest town. And they didn't even know what town it was. So it was, it was very, very bad. Why do you think, because the Navy was involved, the U.S. Navy was involved mm -hmm. in this, right? Why do you think the Navy was involved? What happened is the Strangites became very prosperous. They had a lot, they became very, they had some very uh, nice homesteads on the land, although the land wasn't theirs. It, uh, they didn't really own it, but they thought they did. But they became very well off with the boats and fishing and lumbering. They, they um, had some very prosperous homesteads, and the Gentiles knew that if they could kick the Mormons off the island, that they could have those things for themselves. Uh -huh. And as far as the Navy um, and the U.S. government, it was complicit. They, they were obviously in on it, but for the exact reason, I'm not really sure. But they were obviously in on it because the people had gone, some of the assassins had gone to Chicago and talked to the War Department, wow. the Secretary of the Navy. We need to get rid of this Syrian strangers practice polygamy, just like Joseph Smith. Yeah, just it's as basically. Bad as Joseph Smith. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Is uh, against polygamy. Okay, and then the, the word of wisdom didn't help. And you know what they did to the people in Utah for practicing polygamy? It's just that you went to was the or Utah was the frontier. <laughs> this was mm -hmm. a lot and closer to civilization. Yeah, right. I was going to ask you this other thing. Uh, Lyman White was in Wisconsin. Was he associated with James Strang uh, at any time? Do you he was distantly. Uh, you're talking about the pineries in Wisconsin. Right. right. Where George Miller and Lyman White uh, would cut down lumber for the Nauvoo Temple and for uh, the, the homes and so forth in Nauvoo. And uh, they shipped the logs down the Mississippi River. They're just floating them down? Mm -hmm. Is that what they did, basically? Right. But Time George together, Miller became a, a Strangite. Who did? Uh, General George Miller. Oh, okay. He went down to from try to settle. Legion? What's that? He was from the Nauvoo Legion? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, George Miller, who was a very good friend of Joseph, of Joseph Smith. He went down to try to settle up with uh, the Lyman White colony, and he didn't like it down there, and found that uh, he agreed with uh, James Strang, went back from Texas, back to 
Beaver Island, towards the Beaver Island, and picked up one of the brothers of uh, Newell K. Whitney, was Clark Whitney, and took the two families, took about 30 people up there. So Lyman White was... Well, Lyman White's son was married to George Miller's daughter. So Orange White, so Orange White, Two up. colors? Yeah, orange white. He's <laughs> <laughs> really bad. He's singing the blues. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Was was Lyman White there before Strang got there? Or were they there? Oh, it sounds like they overlapped for some time at least. Lyman White went to Texas and he stayed in Texas. Because I thought he went to Wisconsin before he went to Texas. Yeah, but he was in, in the same area of Wisconsin. He was in the Pineries, which is on the western side, along the Mississippi River. Oh, so they, so he wasn't in the same area, no. the same strength. Okay, I was I was I was curious about that. Okay, and for those of you who really want to get a Lyman White thing, see my Mel Johnson interview. <laughs> Mel Mel's the Lyman White expert. You're the strength out expert. This is great. Um, as long as don't ask me theology. <laughs> and if you want theology, Bill Shepard. <laughs> yeah, or Kyle. You well, well, I'm going to have to talk to Kyle because we we, we've, we've just been getting into Elvira slash Charlie Thompson. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> But uh, I think Kyle's coming to Utah, so we'll, we'll, we'll have a part two, hopefully. Okay, that's great. <laughs> so, wow. And... Uh, well, the, the last thing, so uh, I think Lincoln, when he was shot, he died pretty quickly. But as you mentioned, James Strang lingered for weeks. Um, I mean, with modern medicine, he probably could have been saved, right? Would you agree with that? Because wasn't it just an infection from the bullet wound that, that killed him? He was, uh, the bullet had gone into his spine and caused paralysis. Oh, I didn't know that. And... Uh, I believe it also went into his kidney, his left kidney. So I know that the exterior wounds had wound had uh, healed, but the interior wound had not. Okay. So, so they really needed to get that bullet out in order to save his life. Right. And he just wasted away and died, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and like Joseph Smith, he failed to name a successor. Right, even up to his deathbed. Uh, they said, is there anything you want to say? Uh, and he said, no, just had, tell everybody to take care of their families. And he refused to name a successor. And at the very last time, minute, they said, is there anything else you want to say? And he said, yes, and he died. So I suspect that he would have come clean at the end if, if he could have. He would have said, well, you know, I, I'm i sorry for what I did to these people. It's all my fault that they are suffering so badly. But I really did intend to do good. And I think he really did. I think he intended to do good. He started out looking for profit, and then he became a prophet. <laughs> and, and so th is that your opinion of Joseph Smith as well? Yes. You, you, so... The I think that parallels. he started out looking, Joseph Smith started out looking for money for his family. It was all for good purpose to support his family. And he got a little carried away. People carried it away as well. And uh, and he, he got carried away and started believing his own stories. And that's what James Strang did. And I, but basically, I think that they had good intentions, and they meant the best for their people. And then at the end, when they realized what they had done, they were sorry for it. Well, that's really interesting. And I'm not sure that Joseph Smith's church would have continued if he hadn't been martyred. I think maybe it would have fallen by the, the wayside. Maybe polygamy would have been the end of it. I'm not sure. I mean, I've heard speculation um, that Joseph Smith was trying to end polygamy because mm -hmm. um, he was just realizing it was just too big of a hornet's nest. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as far as we know, he didn't. <laughs> so. And then uh, 
Brigham Young carried it forward. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so because James never uh, mentioned a successor, um, couldn't apostles call new apostles? Or yes. Apostles oh. could ordain new apostles. But they didn't. Because they didn't realize it. They oh, kept really? waiting for a prophet, a new, the, the only God could anoint a prophet. Right. Because that's a big deal in Strangite church. Yeah, that's a big theology. thing in the Strangite church. The prophet, and because uh, the God, they're still waiting, they're the still greater. waiting for anoint. Yeah, only God can anoint a prophet. And they're still waiting for God to anoint another prophet. And what happened is all of, they lost all of their apostles before they realized that they needed to carry out that on, that only apostles could have ordained apostles. Finally, there was only one apostle left. He ordained Wingfield Watson to be an apostle. And then Wingfield Watson really didn't have anybody else to, to call. And uh, it, it went down to like the... Uh, High priests, and right now all they have are high priests. They don't have the higher ones, higher office. And I understand Kyle Bashir's his PhD dissertation was on Wingfield Watson. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to get too far into that because I'll save that for Kyle. But do you have any idea, kind of birth and death dates for Wingfield Watson? Wingfield Watson came from Wales and went to work in the lead mines of Illinois. Uh, and he was on a boat when he met some... He and, he and his wife were intending on going to Nauvoo to be baptized uh, by the LDS, um, the Josephites. Yeah, Brighamites. And they happened to meet some uh, Strangite missionaries on the boat. That was going down the Mississippi, and the the Strangite missionaries convinced them that they should go to Boree, and to well not to Boree but to Beaver Island, and become members of James Strang's church instead of Salt Lake. Instead of going to Salt Lake City, so the family continued on, went to Beaver Island, became very devout. I think he was probably he they went on the island 1852. It's one day, and he was probably 1820, born 1820, no, probably about, yeah, 1825, 1830 is when he was born, probably. 1852, he went to Beaver Island, and then after the, the saints were expelled off of uh, Beaver Island, he went back to Wisconsin with a bunch of them, but he felt the need to be back by Beaver Island in case they got to get back on their land again. So he went up to uh, Michigan and stayed in the area on the mainland off of Beaver Island, and he set up his own church, basically. He was not his own church, but Strang's church, uh, baptizing some of the Indians there and some of the people up there. And he was a gadfly as far as the RLDS. He said, no, you can't join the RLDS. You're Strangites. Mm -hmm. Very interesting man. Very. So he didn't care about the prophecy that Joseph Smith III would one day lead the church? No. That didn't bother him at all? No. Hmm. There was a Strangite apostle who said that, who, was, uh, who convinced the Strangites to join the RLDS church. His name was Lorenzo Dow Hickey. And he said that when Joseph III was a young man of 13, 14 or so, that James Strang climbed through the window at William Mark's house and went into the bedroom and laid his hands on the head of Joseph Smith III and ordained him to be his successor. Oh, really? And... Joseph the Third said, "That's nonsense." He said, "I had my dog, my father's dog Major, with me all the time. He would not have let anybody come in through the window. It did not happen." 
but Lorenzo Dow Hickey insisted it did. And so a lot of the Strangites followed Joseph III. Oh, okay. Because of that. So there was conflict between Wingfield Watson and Lorenzo Dow Hickey. Huh, that's interesting. So did Hickey, so Hickey basically joined the RLS church? And, mm-hmm. Okay. And then he got kicked out, yeah. Oh, for? He was just a very ornery, cranky guy. <laughs> He changed his mind, I guess. I'm not sure. All right. And so uh, has, has there been kind of a continuous Strangite church or congregation in Vori since 1856, would you say? No. The, the saints, the Strangites went to Wisconsin, to Jackson County, West, or Jackson, uh, Jackson County, Wisconsin. Oh, really? Yeah. Not Missouri, but... Uh, and from there, they had a, a settlement by Black River Falls. There was also a group that went to Atchison, Kansas. And from Atchison, Kansas, there's a group that went out to uh, Alamosa, Colorado. Oh. And another group that went to New Mexico. And, but they were all just very, you know, a, a couple of families here and there. And the group that was in Alamosa decided to come back to uh, Burlington, to Spring Prairie. And that's a group that Bill Shepard is from. His parents or his grandparents came from, from Colorado to settle up in Burlington. And that's where most of that group is from now. It's descended from those that were out in Colorado. But none of James Strang's children ever joined his church. And uh, I'm not Even sure if there's... four wives? No. Oh, wow. Were they pretty... I mean, do you know if they were burned by the whole issue? Or? They were burned by the issue, and they were afraid that somebody was going to find out they were Strangite and come and burn their house down, you know, or or uh, or hurt them. So did they go family. by Strang's name, or did they, do you know? Some of them did not go by Strang's name. So they did not want it known that they were Strangites or that they had practiced polygamy. And that's where a lot of the doubt comes in with the RLDS Church, too. The Strangites that came into the RLDS Church, in some cases, denied polygamy, even though they had known that it was practiced on Beaver Island. But the group that's uh, in uh, Burlington, Wisconsin right now, there's probably... There's less than 100, between 50 and 100. Okay. And they are basically people from, from uh, that were, uh, their ancestors were converted by somebody called Granny Flanders, who was a very devout woman. And they were like, I think she was in New Mexico or Colorado, and, and she converted a lot of people. And then they all basically went up to Spring Prairie, Burlington. And that's where that group is from. Hmm. And that's, uh, that's where they are today. They still exist. They still have a church. They're wonderful people. Yeah. They meet on a Saturday, and it's fun to go and visit oh, with Mormon them and Road. then go to dinner. <laughs> is, is it still on Mormon Road? No, it's not on Mormon oh, Road. Oh, it's not. <laughs> it's Spring Prairie Road. Okay. But it's just up the hill from Mormon Road. <laughs> and Mormon Road's still there. Okay. What a side trip. From what a, a From side. a basket we are. There you go. <laughs> Got in trouble. <laughs> um, are, so, um, so you've written the, the first book. Are, are you working on a sequel then with, with all the census information and that sort of thing? Uh, that's an article that I just wrote for the John Whitmer Historical Association. And it'll be coming out uh, in their special anniversary edition. Oh, so I was lucky so. to hear that. I got the preview. And I guess you kind of did, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Any idea when it'll be out? No. No? Okay. Uh, I was, uh, I'm going to edit a book. I proposed a, a book uh, that will be a collection of essays from specialists on certain aspects of, different aspects of the Strangites. 
such as uh, Cheryl Bruner will be talking about the Illuminati, uh, oh. you know, uh, Strangites and Freemasons, and uh, uh, Robin Jensen about the history. I can never say that word, history or history rock. History or anyway, all the records about James Strang and Strangites that you can find in all the history books. Okay. Uh, historiography. Historiography. There we go. Okay. I can never say that word. <laughs> uh, Chris Blythe with the coronation. Oh. And uh, Kyle Bashir's about the comparison about the the first visions of Joseph Smith and James Strang. Oh. So there's be a whole there's a whole, Newell Newell Bringhurst. And uh, just and John Hamer and a whole bunch of experts that They're, each have a. Some of my a, favorite people are in this book. <laughs> they have a chapter to write. I think almost everybody you said has been on Gospel Tangents uh -huh. so far. So. <laughs> it's going to be an amazing book. It's actually 13 years delayed. Oh We had wow. planned it. John Hamer and I had planned it 13 years ago, and he was uh, became involved in in some other projects and at the time I didn't have the skills to edit the way that I can now so I went back and uh, talked to the people who had submitted essays before and they all agreed to do their essays again as, as some of them were the same essays they wrote 13 years ago but now we're gonna do it that's awesome mm -hmm. um, do, do you have a publisher yet uh, I have submitted it to one publisher, and uh, I hope to hear back from them soon, okay. because almost all the essays are all already done. Well, good. Should be easy to get out then. Mm -hmm. We have uh, an essay about the Strangite concept of deity. So, we have some uh, really good ones. I know, that's ones. really interesting. Bill Shepard talked about that on my podcast. Mm -hmm. That was really, really interesting. So, very... I know Strangites call themselves Mormons, mm -hmm. um, very non-LDS, but very different from Christianity in general as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for a preview, go check out my Bill Shepard interview. So, and I'm going to have uh, an essay about how many people were exiled from the island, and how, and also about uh, Strangites that became our LDS. Okay. So we have a whole collection of about. 10 experts that are going to be writing essays. The RLDS were actually really good at gathering all the non Brighamites. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> they gathered up the Whiteites. They did. <laughs> I think the Whitmerites, the Strangites, yeah. Well, it's the fact that Co if you were living in a community and you were a member of the church, uh, Joseph Smith's church, you believed it, and you were active in your community, in your church, there in your community, and then all of a sudden, the church over in Nauvoo packed up and left. That didn't mean that you weren't a member of that church still. They just, they weren't, the church moved, they didn't. So, all of a sudden, they lost their church. The church went off without them. And they had no identity. So I think that Joseph the Third presented their identity. Huh, that's really interesting. Well, is there anything we've missed? I think we've skipped around everything. <laughs> All right, are you going to stay put in Florida? Or, or am I going to have to keep chasing you? Oh, I think we'll stay put for now because I had a nightmare a couple of weeks ago. And my nightmare... I was driving down a road and it was snowing. It was a country road and there was like a foot of snow in front of my car and it was snowing and it was cold. And I woke up thinking that was a real nightmare because I don't like the cold anymore. I like it warm. Yeah, we, I've chased you to Alaska and, and I finally caught, caught you in Florida. So there this is exciting. <laughs> I like it in Florida. I think, I, just so you guys know, I think I asked Vicki at least five years ago, to be honest. So mm -hmm. it's taken me a long time to get her. So 
<laughs> well, it was, took me a long time to get my records back together, and I still am not exactly accurate on everything that I say, because I'm going off my 20-year-old memory. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't know any different. <laughs> well, if you read my book, you will. That's right. <laughs> All right, remind us again what the name of your book is. God Has Made Us a Kingdom, Dream Strang, and the Midwest Mormons. All right. By Signature Books. Yes. It's a fantastic book, so... Vicki Speak, thank you so much for being here on Gospel Tangents. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Florida. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Vicki Speak. Vicki, thank you so much for hosting me and for all the fun times we had there. And I look forward to seeing you at Whitmer. Um, if you haven't gotten her book yet, God Has Made Us a Kingdom, you got to get it. It's a fantastic book about James Strang. So. Thanks again, Vicki. Look forward to meeting you, hopefully, at Beaver Island next time. So, we'll see. In our next conversation, I'm excited to introduce Jason Olson. He is the author of The Burning Book, and he recently received a phone call from somebody you might not expect. I got a phone call, and it was uh, Elder Christofferson's uh, wonderful assistant, Judy, and she said, hey, is this Jason Olson? I said, yes, it is. She said, oh, I have, I have Elder uh, D. Todd Christofferson here on, on the line that, who wants to speak with you. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was looking at my wife, and I was kind of, she's like, who is it? I said, it's Elder Christofferson. And uh, she was like, okay. And, um, and then he said, hi, Jason. And I said, hello, Elder Christofferson. She said, I, I'd like to share your story in general conference in a few days. Um, are you okay with that? I just, I wanted to ask you directly. And I said, uh, yes, I'm, I'm okay with it. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks.